Brilliant. Thanks, guys. So this morning we go back into our Ephesian series, um, the next uh, part of our Ephesian series. When did we start? It was last year, huh? Time flies. Somewhere there. So back into the Ephesian series. Paul, if you want to come up. <clears throat> and let's pray for Paul and for all of us as we um, hear his word. Uh, Lord, thank you for Paul. Thank you for his uh, service, Lord. Thank you that he's serving us today by bringing your word to us. We pray, Lord, that as uh, we're in your word today together and as Paul expounds on your word, we want to ask for your Holy Spirit to work in each one of us, Lord. For each one of us, will you convict us? Will you uh, excite us? Will you grow us, Lord? We thank you for the privilege of being in your word together. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Dan. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me all right there? Quite a terrifying moment. I remember um, our moment when they announced that we were going to be elders in the church. Um, and they announced it to the congregation and had that moment of saying, is there anything? Is there, is there anyone? Is there anything? And I kind of wanted to put my, hap- my hand up and say, I've got some stuff. <laughs> I've got some stuff about myself, you know. And the, the point is that um, we're not looking for perfect people. We are looking for people who exemplify some of the graces that God has given us in his word that lead the way for us. So um, one of the theologians says the most extraordinary thing about the qualifications for eldership is just how ordinary they are. It says every believer, when you read Timothy and Titus and you read those qualifications for, for elders, except for the part about teaching, every believer should be aspiring to all those things. There's nothing unique about them. Eldership is just a call to exemplify them, to say, come follow me as I follow Jesus Christ. Guys, I don't want us to miss the significance of the moment of inviting Nathan Manns on, even as a Chelsea fan. We want to, <laughs> we want to celebrate you guys. It's not, this should, should, I mean, even within the congregation, right, there's no surprise, which is a wonderful thing. There's not a, there's not a oh my goodness, who are they? they? This is people who already are leading, who God has brought strength into our midst through them, all right. So I need to stick to time today. It's the first of our third Ephesian series. So if you're not, if you haven't been with us for a long time, I really want to encourage you to go back. We did eight weeks in the first part of Ephesians, which was called In Christ. It was all about our identity. It was all about how we are united with Christ, how we are loved, how we are adopted, how we are called to be with Christ. It's this incredible picture. Have I got this thing right, eh? Let's hear a bit of echo there. Um, And then we went, in Christ, the church has a future. And I just drew such personal confidence from looking at Ephesians chapter 2 and 3 and how God takes these newly adopted people and then forms them into this body, forms them into us, into one hope and shofar and the Baptists and the Presbys and everyone else that is celebrating God and worshiping God this morning around our town. And just this confidence of being in Christ and then we're in Christ Um, together. So turn with me this morning as we start our third series to Ephesians chapter 4. And I I hope you, like me, have been so encouraged by the number of preachers. I haven't been in this pulpit, I think, for six weeks, which I'm a little bit heart sore about because I really like preaching. But on the other side, I'm just so delighting at God bringing through such strength in our preaching. And this is what we're asking God to do across our congregation in every area that we'd begin to see the priesthood priesting. If you know that language, we begin to see God's people functioning in God's gifts, doing it across the congregation, just not in the hands of one or two paid people or special people. Right? And Sarah took us through the Word of God and just what a beautiful sermon. Riley last week, what a profound sermon on vulnerability. Johannes and Ali on hospitality and how God has called us to love one another. Who have I missed out? Batesy was speaking on the Holy Spirit, and I feel like I've missed one or two there. Stefan speaking on all hands on deck, exactly what I'm talking about now, and how God has called us all to function as part of the body. Not necessarily even just in a church, but all of us. So I want to encourage you, on your journey to work, on your run, catch up the Ephesians series. I've been listening to it again, even though I preached the bulk of it. I'm listening to it, just reminding myself of these truths of God's Word, and I want to encourage you to do the same. So this morning, when we turn to Ephesians chapter 4, what you might not know when you read the book of Ephesians is that it's, dis- it's in two distinct parts. 
And chapter 4, you could call that the hinge. Like if you think about a door, chapter 4 is the hinge. It's where this, where this book changes from one kind of focus into another focus. And so the first part of Ephesians is all our, like I was saying, all about identity, about how God builds us, about God. And then the second part of Ephesians in chapter 4, it says this, Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. And there's this moment in Ephesians where Paul now begins to write, How now shall you live? And he begins to write about holiness and about relationships and about how we are supposed to live out this new identity and this new unity that we experience. Did you see that little word, therefore? He's saying, because. Because you now understand your new identity in Jesus. Because you understand all these things, therefore live differently. And he, he carries on, and you'll see as we read this morning where he goes. Let's read together chapter 4 and verse 17. We've actually already preached chapter 4, verse 1 to 16. You can go and catch that up on your run. Let's read from verse 17. With the Lord's authority, Paul says, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do. Right? I want you to keep on thinking in your mind. We've changed gear here. We're now thinking about how you and I and our families are supposed to live, right? Live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against Him. It's not a pretty picture. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. That's not you. That's what Paul's saying. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from Him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life. Do you see even in his instruction that there's a way that you can have received Christ, but you can still wear the old self? Do you see that implicit in the verse? Since you've received Jesus like this, you must now throw off, which means you can also keep on. And Bates is going to be speaking about this at length next week. Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, do this instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So stop telling lies. And Paul goes into six different things here that are just practical outworkings of what he now, he's going to go into examples of what he's saying we need to live like, what your life needs to look like. And so I'm going to do five things this morning, and I'm not actually going to focus too much on this text. I'm going to do a, a helicopter view, if you would, of the, of the whole book of Ephesians. I want to remind us where we're coming from. I want to remind us where we're going to, and I want to speak specifically about a few dangers that I see, two in particular, that I see in the way that we live our Christian lives in the Western world. So the first, the first thing, and there's five points. The first one is this. We're going to go to Ephesians 2, and salvation is not through anything we do. You'll hear that so many times from this pulpit, from a range of preachers. Salvation is by faith in God alone. Let's read it. Let's read Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. If you can't get any clearer. For He raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated, seated us with Him, this is verse 6, in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us. He's pointing at us in all the future ages. And as examples of the incredible wealth of His grace and kindness towards us, as shown in all He has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Now listen, God saved you by His grace. That's a, a verse you should have underlined in your Bible, when you believed. And you, or me, can't take credit for this. This is a gift from God. Salvation, just in case... You know, you're in the, in the lower grade class, like I was for maths, and you're trying to struggle with this. He just wants to re-emphasize it again. Salvation is not a reward for the good works or the good things you have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things that He planned for us to do long ago. 
And so Ephesians, when we get to this third series in Ephesians, and we begin to think about what we should live like, what that should look like, how we should behave, how we should respond, I want to just put front and center of our minds again that none of these instructions in chapter 4, 5, and 6 are anything to do with earning your or my salvation. That's what I'm trying to get through to us so clearly. He, Paul returns to the, the ancient, critical, and beautiful truth that salvation is in God alone. And I just, I just want to say, thank God for that. If this was left to me, if this was left to you, no matter how high your self-assurance quotient, no matter how confident you may be, in the, on our beds at night, we lie there, and in the honesty of our hearts, we must cry out, thank God that this is on him and not on me. But it's so clear, isn't it? God saved you by his grace. You're God's masterpiece. He has created us in Christ Jesus. But then even in this, which is probably the most strong text in the whole Bible around this topic, even right there, do you see he ends off by saying, why? So that you can do for the good works that he has prepared beforehand. So even right there, there's this expectation that we're not just saved, thank you Jesus, sitting on a beach, sipping a pina colada for the rest of our days. No, you are saved so that you can respond to this love, respond to this grace. And so this, the first point is just that this, it's not even part of what I want to preach today, but it just, it's so important that when we come to Ephesians 4, 5, and 6, we have this burning in our minds that this is not talking about me trying to please God so that he goes, okay, I consent, you and I are saved. We are saved by grace, free gift of God. Okay, let's talk about number two. What are we saved from? All right, and I listened to a brilliant podcast this week, but saved, I'll get to it in a moment, but saved, we, we, get, we get Christian on this word, right? We get confused with, with what it means. Just think about a person who's drowning. Help! Help! You got sucked out. I nearly drowned on my honeymoon, actually. Very nearly. And you, you, get, you get sucked out to sea. It's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. And that, that, that's the moment. Or you're in a house, and the house is burning. Don't, don't Christianize this word. Saved is saved. You don't, you, you're dying. You're in, you're in the sea. It's pulling you under. You're in a house. It's burning down around your head, and someone rushes to come and find you and to save you. That's what saved is. But there's three things that this podcast has just helped me um, verbalize. And the guy spoke about identity, about idolatry, and about immorality. He said, those are the three things that we're saved from. We're saved, we're saved firstly in our head. So if you think about identity, it's how we think about ourselves. We're saved from who we think we are and whose we think we are, if that makes sense. I'll speak about it a little bit more in a moment. Idolatry is who we worship. We need to be saved from who we worship. And immorality is what we do. It's the things that we do. And we need to be saved from what we do. So think, think about it like this. Identity. We no longer understand who God made us to be. We don't. We don't understand who God made us to be and the story that we are meant to live in. We've lost touch with Eden. We've lost touch with who God made us to be and how we're supposed to live. And God comes and saves us and says, here's a return to the story. Here's why I made you. This is how I made you to flourish. That's the saving we need. What about idolatry? Well, because we are so lost in the story, we have no idea who we are supposed to worship. We have no idea. Our, but our hearts were made to worship. All of us can, that resonates. We feel it. Our hearts were made to worship. So we chase after the girl that we, that we think is going to fulfill that part of our heart which is longing to worship. Or we chase after a career. Maybe to the, to the point of destroying our family. We pursue a career because our hearts must worship something. In my position, you might even take something beautiful like ministry. And you pursue the ministry rather than God. And that becomes the idol in your heart. And you worship that. And so our, our identity is broken. But our idolatry is broken. What we, who we worship is broken. Kathy Keller Tim Keller's lesser-known wife, 
says this beautiful, beautiful thing. She says, pull up your uncontrollable emotions by their roots, and you'll find your idols clinging to the roots. Pull up your uncontrollable emotions by the roots, and you'll find your idols clinging to them. Why? Because we are made to worship, but we need saving from our idolatry. What are we saved from? We saved from an identity crisis. We don't know who we are. We don't know why we're here. We saved from an idolatry crisis. We don't know who we are supposed to worship, and we saved from immorality because we no longer understand who God made us to be. We no longer understand why we're here. So we've latched onto every kind of idol that our heart can find, and we pursue those things. And so we begin to sin. Do you see that? One and two informs three. Who we worship and who we understand ourselves to be always informs what we do. You can try and change what you do. You might be successful for a little bit, but ultimately what you believe, what you think in your head, and what's in your heart will come out through your hands. Always. Always, always happens. By our actions... We crush others who get in the way of our career advancement. This is some of the outworking of this immorality. And guys, you, you might not realize that you're doing this because you might not do it. Do you, know, do you know Suits? You know like Harvey and the way that Harvey is? If any of you have watched Suits, you know, like Harvey, and he's like just so down the line. You might not be like that, but you might have a much more subtle way of crushing someone so that you get ahead in the career that you're pursuing because that's your idol. That's your identity. And so that's how the immorality comes out in your life. It might come out by, by your gossip and slander because your, your idol is your own reputation. And so you need to make people around you seem less so that you seem more because your God is, is, is yourself. It's your own reputation. And this can outwork its way in, in so many different ways. You might sleep with your girlfriend or your boyfriend trying to fulfill the desire that only God can fulfill. And friends, we need to understand that these desires are god given desires. We were made to flourish. We were made for sexual union. We were made to flourish in our careers. All of these things, but they were never made as ultimate things. And so when we miss how God made us, who we are, what we're here for, and we miss who we are supposed to worship, these things become ultimate and the whole thing gets completely, completely messed up. That's immorality. And well, how do we see these things in Ephesians? Well, I'm going to speak about 1, 2, 3, and I'm going to speak about 4, 5, 6 for the rest of the sermon today. And I'll explain what I'm talking about. Chapter 4, 5, 6, Paul begins to say, this is how you should live your life. He begins to speak about holiness. I told you already, he gives you six examples where he says, you used to steal, don't steal anymore. You used to be a thief, don't do that anymore. And he goes through, don't lie, don't do this. And he gives some very practical examples. Then he goes on to speak about relationships. He speaks, we're going we're gonna to have a whole relationship series. And he speaks about husbands and wives. He speaks about parents and children. We'll speak about singleness in that series. That's a little bit of like a, a crowbar in there, but it, we're going to put it in there. We're going to speak about um, slaves and masters. Uh, how, do we, how does this outwork in our workplace? Most theologians say that this whole section of Ephesians is actually entirely relational. Because sin is a relational thing. Sin always affects us relationally. And then it goes on in chapter 6 to speak about how we must put on the armor of God. How do we defend ourselves? And so that's the do, the do, the do, the do, the do. And some of you in the room are going, I'm so comfortable right there. I love the doing stuff. And others are like, don't give me any doing. I don't want to do any of that. I just want to soak in the presence of Jesus with a good Bethel song for like 50 years. Just leave me right here. Don't tell me to do anything. I'm very happy right here, right? Chapter 1, 2, and 3, as I've been speaking about, actually, let me, let me go a little bit more in detail around it. It speaks about being united in Christ. The word is the same word that's used for being united in marriage. You know when it says what God has united, let no man separate? It's the same word. You are united in the same way to Jesus Christ. Now, what happens when you get married, right? What's mine is? What's mine is? And what's yours is? This is an incredible thought, because when we get united to Jesus Christ, do you know what's His? Righteousness. Sinless life. Perfection. Strength. Ability to overcome all of these things. And who gets it? Well, I I married Him. So I get it. 
it's mine. And what does he get? It's a really bad bargain. <laughs> right? He gets my sin. He gets my brokenness. He gets my lack of identity. This is, this is what, what is called the great exchange. We are unified with Jesus Christ. And when we are unified, it means what's yours is mine. And what's mine is yours. And that's the most wondrous thought. We could literally just spend a sermon just thinking about that. And you could go home and we'd be done. We receive goodness, blessing, inheritance, adoption, love. This is the language of Ephesians 1 and 2. It says you are loved by God. Do you know that? Do you feel that somewhere deep? Or do you look in the mirror and say, I hate you? Do we, do we look in the mirror and say, I'm loved by the King of Kings, the one who is perfect in every way. And he looks at me and says, you are good. In fact, that's a lie. He looks at you and says, you are very good. That's the truth. That's what we receive from Jesus. And then he doesn't just, he doesn't just leave us there. That's, that's the forgiveness part, right? You loved, you're chosen, you're forgiven, you're redeemed, all of these Ephesians language. And then he says, and you're adopted. This is the forgiveness and the fellowship. I don't just want you forgiven. I'm going to leave you there. I want you with me. I want you near me. I want you to walk with me, to learn how to walk with me. And this is the four, five, and six. This is one, two, three, four, five, six. Are you with me now? purchases our freedom and it goes on and on and it explains at the end of chapter one how we are given this mighty power the same power that raised jesus christ from the dead is alive and well within us can i ask you a question why well because four five and six is coming there is an outworking of this faith and for it we need the living power of god inside of us because he goes on in chapter says in two and says because you were dead in your sins that's why we need the power, because we are dead in our sins. And then one of the great signs he carries on in chapter 2 of this new unity, of this marriage with Christ, one of the great signs is that we are unified to people that we could never have imagined being unified to. And Paul is at pains to speak about how the Jew and the Gentile hate each other. He's at pains to describe this relationship and the brokenness of this relationship, and yet how now in God two are made one. It sounds like marriage again. So he's saying, I married you, and now I want you to marry each other relationally, in that sense. And all the young men said, Amen, Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and he builds this new people into a building called the church. And the church, we are one of these little ecclesias. We're one of millions around the world. But all together, we are this collective billboard that God holds up to the principalities and powers and to the world and goes, look at her. Isn't she beautiful? Well, not so much, God. No, 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 you haven't seen her properly. Look at her. Isn't she beautiful? Because she's mine. And what I am, she is. And what she is, I took on myself. Profound, eh? And when we start to get this, guys, it changes who we are. Like, like, not like in a theoretical sense. If you knew me, my, this is my, one of my older sisters, so good to have you, sitting here this, with us this morning, visiting me. If you knew who I was at 15 and who I am at 40, my identity has shifted so completely because of these truths. They don't stay there. They get here, and they come out here. It's changed the way that I parent in my family. It's changed the way that I love Kate. It's changed the way that I, I fill in my tax return, or whatever. The, this is the practical implication of our lives that is changed. And Paul is saying, therefore, now, because God has changed our identity, because God has properly informed our idolatry, who we worship, because God wants to fiddle in the detail of your immorality, He wants to work out what it is that we're doing with our lives. We get to chapter 4 and it says, now live this way. Now, because of what you've understood, I want you to live a different life. 
All right, number three. The next ones will be quicker by God's grace and His mercy. There's two dangers I want to speak about. The first danger is this. It's easy to remember. No four, five, six without one, two, three. I've already been speaking about this, but we cannot live in four, five, and six, how you behave without true understanding of one, two, three. Again, I want to encourage you, if you missed part one and part two of our Ephesians series, go back, listen to it, let God wash you in the words of chapter one, two, and three, and let Him reform your identity. Guys, this is not a moment thing. We're going to be doing this for the rest of our lives. The rest of our lives, God's Word is going to wash us and remind us because we live every day in a false story. And He's saying, no, Paul, that's not who I called you to be. This is who I called you to be. This is how I made you to flourish. This is how you work. It's only God that we can turn to with the user manual that says, this is how you work. Friends, if, you, if you've been a parent or you've been parented, all of you have been parented in some way, shape, or form, we recognize this immediately. We recognize this desire for moralistic behavior. The minute that your kid has a tantrum on the floor, I'm not interested in his heart. I just want him to stop what he's doing because it's embarrassing me in public. That's the truth of the matter. And many of us have been schooled in this way of thinking from our youngest years because that's how we've been parented. That's how, God forbid, we are parenting. And so it's hard to get at the heart of the issue. When I'm watching TV and a kid is busy nattering and yakking and whatever else and irritating me, I just want them to stop because I'm dad and I said so. I don't give a rats about your heart. Just stop making that noise, right? I'm, I'm overplaying it. But this is the, this is the difficulty is that the, the actual the pull and the thrust of this thing is hard. When we start working on the heart issues, it's much easier just to behavior modify much easier to come into church and just, yes, brother, I'm well, thank you, brother, blessed. Yeah, yeah, I've got, I, I learned a few verses. Let me, let me tell you one of my verses. And you look the part and you feel the part, but actually your heart is far from God. And no one knows it, like the song says, nobody knows it but me. Right? No one knows. And we can live this false lie because we've gone off the behavior. We've gone off the four, five, six instead of one, two, three. How does this link to immorality, identity, and idolatry? I'm going to go backwards here, and I'll go very quickly. Immorality is what we do. With this way of thinking, we go, I want to change the bad things I do. And, and often that's sincere, guys. It's sincere. People look at their lives, and they go, I don't want this brokenness. I don't want whatever it may be. Fill in the dots. I want a different life. I want to change. That's the motivation. That's the immorality. But the idolatry is very strange on this one because who gets worshipped? In, in a very weird way, you are God. You are God because the person that you look to to fix you is you. If I just behave, if I just do this, if I'm the one who can be strong enough to not look at pornography, if I'm the one who can be strong enough to fight to keep my marriage together, then who's God in your story? You. Oh God, it's weird, right? You have, this is, this is the tragedy with so much sin, is that people get the right diagnosis. So uh, we watch people spin off into whatever it might be, and they're actually chasing a desire that's a God-given desire. They say things like, I, I, feel, I feel like I've got to pursue my true self. That's a God-given desire. God is the one who we go to, and He says, this is who you really are. Or they say things like, I hate racism. Black Lives Matter. I hate racism. It's 100% in line with God's thinking. But what do we turn to to fix the problem? That's the major question here. And so we turn to politics. It's not going to fix it. We turn to rioting. It's not going to fix it. It's only God, so we diagnose the right problem, but we're prescribing the wrong medication for the cure. And what does identity have to do with this? Well, identity, this is the biggest part of Ephesians, is I want to change the bad things that I do, but I am not actually changed. I'm the same person I was. I've just had a little bit of a, re a revelation of what I want to change, and so I'm going to work on this with blood, sweat, and tears. Ephesians doesn't allow you that space. This is what it says about you. 
It says, once you were dead. That's all you need to read, actually. But once you were dead, because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commanders of the power in the unseen world. And so it's like turning to a dead body and saying, resurrect yourself. That's literally the metaphor that he's holding up. And so it's like the picture I have here of trying to fix ourselves is like a dead person who's been made into a puppet with strings. And they're trying to do, they're trying to do four, five, six, but the minute that those strings are gone, it's just a dead body on the floor. That's the metaphor that Paul holds up for. He says, you were dead. How do you think you can give yourself salvation? How do you think you can live a holy life? Four, five, and six. You got it? The second great danger, well, let, me, let, me just, let me describe a little bit. What does this person look like? This person who has, has fallen into the danger of trying to do 4, 5, and 6 without a proper understanding of 1, 2, and 3. Friends, often they feel worthless and defeated under the surface because they try and try with sincere motives to change themselves, to live better. Next time I won't. Next time I won't do this. Next time I will do that. But they find themselves coming short. Remember that, that movie, A Night's Tale? There's that, there's that line in that movie. It's like, you have been tried, you have been tested, and you have been found wanting. It's like the stuff of nightmares, right? Like when, you, when you think about that in your life, you've been tried, you've been tested, and you've been found wanting. I'm like, please, God, no. And people leave feeling defeated, and they leave feeling worthless. Or they might feel, ironically, they might feel self-righteous because they look at everyone else around them, and they might just be able to do more than the people around them in their own natural ability. They've got better self-control. They've got better discipline. They wake up at office five every morning. They exercise. And they look at everyone around them and go, you bunch of losers. I am. I am so great at getting this thing right. You, you're such a gossip. I know how to keep my mouth shut. And it actually, ironically, leads to self-righteousness. And then very often, this person walks away from church completely. They walk away from God's story because they, they realize inside of them that they can't measure up. And so they just go, if I can't ever measure up, I'm actually just going to go and live a wild, rebellious, whatever. And that doesn't have to look like parties until midnight every night. I mean, it shows you how old I am, but I think that's really rebellious till midnight. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Midnight! Oh yeah, we made that New Year's Eve, people. We made it. But they, they go like the other way, and that can look like silent rebellion, but they just turn their back on God, and they go, I'm never going to measure up. And no one's ever sat with them and said, you're not supposed to. None of us do. None of us do. So hopefully that helps ground it a little bit. The second, the second great danger, and this, this one is one I think is so prevalent among Christians, is that no one, two, three, without four, five, six. This is the other side of this coin, and I think we often fall here. The Western church, certainly churches I've been part of, and certainly church cultures that I've experienced, seem to emphasize the saving part of salvation and then stop. Yay! They did Alpha. They got saved. Woo! What about 4, 5, 6? What about how now we should live? Because we've understood this, now there's... And outworking, we're supposed to lead a, a holy life. And so what we find is we find weak, um, these are not positive words, anemic, sin-riddled Christians who seem to have made friends with the murderer of their Savior. That's a C.H. Spurgeon thought. He says, anyone who makes friends with sin is made friends with the murderer of their Savior. What a thought. It's only because of sin did Jesus have to die. Sin is Jesus' murderer. How dare we make friends with sin? This is, this is what we do when we, when we understand, thank you, Jesus, you've saved me, I'm so happy, I'm so grateful, and then we stop. That's how our lives begin to outwork. We, we see in the area, let's go through our three things again, immorality, idolatry, immorality, idolatry, and identity. We see in the immorality, we see Christians who don't seem very perturbed with sin, very comfortable to live in worldly ways, comfortable with greed. Let's not just call out the big sins. Greed is rampant in the Christian church. Let's call it out. Comfortable with greed. We live consumeristic lives, chasing after one comfort, after the next comfort, after the biggest bank account. This is us. This is not the world. This is those who used to be dead in, in sins, but now have been resurrected to life, but have grown dull, and our consciences are seared. Are you feeling encouraged this morning? <laughs> 
we are, <laughs> we see the respectable sins making a huge return in these kind of lives when we've had revelation of one, two, three, or some revelation of one, two, three, but we don't understand four, five, six. We see gossip. Oh, that thing is a dangerous thing. We see slander. We see just opinionated, bombastic Christians. Oh my goodness, does the church need to repent around the vaccine debate? Genuine, guys. It's a shocker. Not what you believe or don't believe. The way that we hold our beliefs is shocking. Opinionated, bombastic, shutting people down, unkind, unthoughtful on both sides. Both sides of the debate. We've got to look into these things. What about comfortable with sexuality out of line with God's instructions? Just doing this with my girlfriend, doing this with my boyfriend. I believe this around homosexuality, this around that, whatever it might be. We, we compromising, compromising, compromising. The, the most scary part of this is the idolatry. When you understand a little bit of one, two, three, but you don't know that God's called you on to more and to live a holy life. Friends, who is your God? Who do you worship? What's your idol? Well, you worship a God of your own imagination. You cobble together, you piece together a God from bits of information that you like. You sing a, you sing a song, a Hillsong song, and, you, and I'm not, I love Hillsong, and you sing one of their songs and you like a line from that song, so you take that and you make that part of your God. And that becomes a part of your puzzle. Then you hear someone preach, maybe even a, a, an anointed great preach and you like just one part and so you add that to your God then you take some of your desires and some of your own personal needs and you plug that in there then you watch God TV and you, and you hear a prosperity gospel guy and you go oh, I like that, blessed, yes take that plug that in there and before you know it you've created a God entirely of your own making who has nothing to do with the God of the Bible you don't have a God of justice, you don't have a God of love or you have like one extreme of this. You have like a God who only judges people and only hates people and only wants people to burn because we've forgotten the God of our Bible. It's the most dangerous thing. We make, we make our own God. We cobble together this God. And then what does that do with our identity? Well, we, we like the world, but we also want to be Christians. But Christianity is so onerous. All these extra things... We have to do. And so the longer we live like this, the more prone we are to think about Christianity like this. Man, it's a lot of time, eh? Every Sunday. And, and life group. Gay, yeah, gay. Yeah. Not for me. They want me to give money? That, that, oh, they're just after my money. No. And we begin to see the cost of Christianity just gets bigger, like this huge mountain growing in our minds. And we forget the wonder of what God is doing and the story that He's, that he's leading us on. And friends, I, I want to I warn you that your prayers are unanswered because your God you're praying to is not real. It's not the God of the Bible. It's a God of your imagination. And the only prayers that are answered are in your imagination because it's the God of your imagination. I know that sounds harsh, but I, I, yeah. This person, what do they look like? Well, friends, they look hypocritical. Because Jesus loves me, and I'm saved, but man, I don't want to do any of the stuff. Do you know, it, it's really, it, it amazes me when you talk to people who are far away from Jesus. The church thinks that somehow they want to compromise so that they can be more like people in the world. And people in the world are going to go like, oh, yeah, we love that. We're going to come and join you. Actually, it's the opposite that happens. People in the world are looking for something different. And when they see a compromising church, a hypocritical church, they look in and they go, I don't want anything to do with this. You guys say this, but you live this. I don't want that. I'm feeling confused as it is. Why must I come from one confused system into another confused system? does exactly the opposite of what we actually are hoping that it, that it does. When we begin to live like this, we bail on gospel community. I'm not just talking about Sunday church, guys. I'm talking about living our lives like Riley was speaking about last week, vulnerably with one another. Why in the world would we stick around when it's so tough in church? Why would we hang around together? It's really difficult. And when, I, when I'm with these people and they are following these four, five, six instructions of Ephesians, well, I just feel so guilty and I just feel so shame. And that's just not my true self. So I'm going to go back out here and not really be part of gospel community because when I go there, I feel guilty. 
And so we bail on gospel community. And on and on we can go. And, and the saddest part about this person is that you can't enjoy sin anymore. When you've had some awakening of the Spirit of God in your heart, when, you've, when you're a believer, I'm not saying these people are not believers, but when you come to God, when you sin, you're like a bear with a sore head. You can't enjoy it anymore. Maybe that's true for some in the room here today. You're forgiven, but you have no fellowship. And then the last thing I want to say this morning, and this is where we want to end, is I'm, I'm rattling on about how we... How, so I'm getting ready for the big... <laughs> for the real part now. I'm just getting boiling hot. Um, I'm going on about negative things, dangers, warnings. Don't live like this. Don't do this. Okay. And I want to end off just by saying, how now do we live? How should we live? What is this supposed to look like? And friends, it's very, very simple, and you would have already guessed it. We're supposed to live in one, two, three, and four, five, six. It's the whole thing. Ephesians is actually the most beautiful encouragement to us of how not only does God call us to these things, but how God empowers us and equips us for living like this. He doesn't just say, right, well, I've saved you. Now I'm going to put these things in front of you that are really difficult. Holiness, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. And actually, you're just on your own. Good luck. He's like, no, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, I'm putting it in you. The Holy Spirit is going to be poured out on you, and He's going to empower you to do these things that when you first look at it, when you're a brand new believer, you go, how in the world am I going to do this? It's that power that begins just inside of us. What does this man or woman look like? It's, it's absolutely beautiful. When you think about the themes of, of 1, 2, and 3, chapter 1, 2, and 3, and you think about how God comes and speaks over me and speaks over you like sonship and daughtership and you are chosen and you are loved. These are words that we're desperate to hear. He then says, you're adopted. Paul, you're adopted into my family. And then I look around and I go, God, I'm not so sure about all my brothers and sisters. And he goes, yeah, that as well. Unity. I put you together. I'm going to make all these strange people around you. You're going to love them like your brothers and sisters, like your real earthly brothers and and sisters. And then Paul's crowning prayer in Ephesians chapter 3, he says this. This is now reflecting on what he's written in chapter 1, 2, and 3. He says, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees. Doesn't it make sense now? Of course you fall to your knees. When you realize what God has done, you fall to your knees. And he says, and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth, I pray that from His glorious, unlimited resources, He will empower you with inner strength through His Spirit. Why do you need empowering? For four, five, and six. That's why we need empowering. Then He says, then Christ will make His home in your heart. You see, not just forgiveness, fellowship. He wants to live with us. He wants to be with us. He'll make His home in your heart as you trust Him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. You might be a new believer and you're saying, Paul, this is so overwhelming. Friends, your root might be this small today. But this text teaches us that your roots are going to grow. And they're going to grow. And in 20 years' time, your roots are going to be like a, like a pine going down deep. And then in another 10 years, they're going to be like, I don't know, what's got longer roots than a pine? An oak tree. Don't, don't button me on that. I'm not sure, all right? <laughs> don't, don't take that to your science lecture. Or your... But the roots are going down deeper and deeper. It takes time. It takes time. And Paul carries on. He says, your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand identity as all God's people should. How wide, how long, how high, and how deep His love is. May you experience. Church, I'm reading this over you this morning. May you experience the love of Christ. Though it is too great to understand fully. Then, when you understand it, you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now, all glory to God, who is able through His mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or even that we might think. Glory to Him in the church, in Christ Jesus, through every generation, forever and ever. Isn't that an, don't you want to be this person? 
Don't you want to be this person? I do. I read it and I go like, God, make me this man. Last week I read this Ephesians chapter 1 where Paul prays and he says, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light and I pray that you'll understand the incredible greatness of God's power. And he prays this powerful prayer in Ephesians chapter 2. And I felt that the Holy Spirit reminded me that Jesus, the Bible says, Jesus stands before the Father and intercedes for you. He prays day and night. He prays for you and I. And you know what I prayed? I said, it's a cheeky prayer. I said, Jesus, would you pray this for me? Would you pray this that Paul prays for the Ephesians? Would you pray this to the Father for me? It's, it's profound prayers that Paul is praying. I want to be this man. I want to be this person. I want us to be this person. And then as they begin to realize who they are, so the disciplines begin in their lives. And they begin to read God's word. Why? Because their identity is changing and they go, oh, I thought the world was like this. I thought this was who I am. Actually, I've now realized this is who I am and I need to figure out who God is. So what's the next natural step? You don't read your Bible because, you know, read the Bible and pray every day and you'll grow, 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 like, you know, eat apples and keep the doctor away kind of thing. Like, it's not like that. You read the Bible because you understood this God and you go, wow, I want to know who He is. Who are you, God? And as we do that, our idols begin to be dismantled. We read a section and it goes, you go, oh my goodness, I'm the greedy guy in the story. I thought I was Jesus in the story. Actually, I'm, I'm the adulterous woman. I'm the person who wants to throw the stone at her. Whatever it may be. And the Bible begins to sift us. And we begin to realize, I, I, I don't know. Is it just me? Do you, guys, do you guys want this in your lives? Do you want to be these people? This is, this is what I'm looking at. And I'm, I'm encouraged. As, as our view of God gets clearer, these idols, these, these hearts that were made to worship suddenly find the place where they're supposed to worship. We suddenly find the right temple. And we begin to worship the living God. And then surely, surely, as we get caught up in the wonder of all of this, we fall on our knees and we say, God, what do you want of me? This is the morality. The what do we do? But it doesn't come at the front. We don't start there, God, what do you want of me? Okay, let me go and rework. No, no. We start with identity. We look at who God is. And these things, are they're not linear. It's happening simultaneously. But then we fall on our knees and we say, God, I want to respond. I want to. Not I have to. I want to. And so we, we go to God and we say, God, you want me to stop gossiping? Of course, God. How can I not, God? Look at what you've done for me. Of course I want to stop doing that. You're living in sexual immorality from, from just looking at someone lustfully, the Bible says. The Bible doesn't just, you know, everyone who doesn't, doesn't you know, do these, the big ones, you're, you're off the hook. No, the Bible goes, Jesus says, no, no, you look at a woman lustfully. You look at a man lustfully, right? You're in trouble. All the way through to the big ones. And when we realize that, we go, God, of course, I'll, of course I don't want to do that, God. Of course I don't want to. I want to be pure with you. I want to be in fellowship with you with you. I want to be near to you. You said you make your home in my heart. How can I do this when your home is in my heart? How can I turn on my computer and look at these pictures when you you made your home in my heart? Make sense? This is how it outworks. This is why we live pure lives because of what Jesus has done and what he's shown us. Let me, let me speak to you if you don't know Jesus this morning for one minute and we're done. Jesus in the gospel so beautifully over and over again, we see examples of people who are full of sin. Who the church, like the normal church, there's no way they're coming. There's no way they're walking through the doors. These people are, are judging them, the Pharisees and everyone else. And over and over again, we see these people coming before Jesus. And Jesus says these words to them. He says, I forgive you. I forgive you. And then he says, now go and sin no more. One, two, three, who we are, I forgive you. You're not held by that sin. Four, five, six, but go and sin no more. This is the, this is the experience. Jesus is, is waiting and willing to forgive you. If you don't know him today, he is waiting and wanting to forgive you. But it's not just a moment. It's not just a get your ticket to, to heaven moment. It's not just make sure you're safe for eternity. It's not that moment. It's actually the moment where he says, I want your whole life. I want you to now learn to sin no more, to go forward with me in holiness. Can we pray? And let's call it a day there. Father, 
We, in my bumbling words today, Father, I'm trying to explain the wonders of the majesty of what you have done for us, what you've done in us. Lord, you are the most wondrous God who comes and practically changes our identity, shapes what's been said over our lives. People who've had the most awful things spoken over them by others. People who today say the most awful things to themselves. We don't even need an external party to tell us. We even just speak these lies over ourselves. God, we want to admit that we are so confused sometimes around the story and how we're supposed to live and who we're supposed to worship and how that works its way out in our lives. And we want to say, we're sorry where we've missed it. And we ask you to come and make us your sons and daughters in the way that you do with the living power of the Holy Spirit within us. And would it flow out of us into lives that shine Jesus. That shine, as we're going to read in the the next chapters of Ephesians, that shine glorious relationships. Lord, would our marriages and our relationship with our children and the way that we even work, would it be beacons of light to people? They go, wow, I want what you have. Would the way that we express grace and mercy and love over people's lives, like Ephesians 4 speaks about, Lord, would it be such an example to others that they would long to know the Jesus of chapter 1, 2, and 3. Lord, protect us from moralism. Protect us from trying to make people behave in certain ways before their hearts are turned to you. Lord, when people are acting like that, it's because they don't know you. How else should they act, Lord? Help us, Lord, to lead many sons and daughters through 1, 2, and 3 so that they can understand 4, 5, and 6. In the powerful and wonderful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Friends, we're going to break bread together. Um, There's tables over there and there and outside. Um, Don't get up yet. Wait Wait one second for me. I want to just, this morning, I want to just sober us again in the reality of breaking bread. What you are doing is that Jesus says that when we break bread, we remember him. When we take the bread, it's his body which was broken for us. When we take the blood, it was his blood that was poured out for us. And that's a costly thing, and that's not for everybody. All right? And so scripture teaches us that if you do not actively follow Jesus, this is not a a religious moment that you are welcome to. Okay? You you don't, this is not something we just do lightly. All right? And I want to expand that a little bit this morning. And I want to ask that those of us who are are, are in sin, and we don't want to change it. we're 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 not willing to repent. This is not for us. This is a a taking of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. It's a unifying ourselves with Him. It's a unifying ourselves with the body. And we come to it soberly. We don't just come to it willy-nilly. I know afterwards the kids grab the bread and bless them. They're welcome to. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing that doesn't turn into real blood. It doesn't turn into real flesh. They can eat it afterwards. But in this moment, when we take communion together, it's with that holy sense of awe in our hearts. So, Let's do that together. Can we just do it in in small groups this morning? Let's pray for one another. Let's ask each other, can I pray a specific thing for you? And then we end our morning together. Bless you guys. Love you and see you next week.